everybody. It's good to see you. Welcome back to the Typewriter Factory. So, uh, Gabriel, where are you? Gabe. And we're here to celebrate Gabriel. I'm and, here. I'm here. Uh, woo, Gabriel. Uh, and you're going away from us. I wish we could be doing this in person. And uh, I think actually, don't you guys agree that down the line somewhere, we should all get together right? yeah. with Gabriel. That includes you, Gabriel. Uh, yeah. If you're still here, you know, <laughs> if you haven't gone away, right, you may go somewhere. So uh, everybody here is reading, right? Or how many? We have? Uh, Ted, let me just give you the uh, program, and this will tell everyone else, too. All okay, right. If you can bother to download my program that I made. I couldn't Tony, know. Lisa, Gabe. Traditionally, we go alphabetical by last name. Tony, Lisa, Gabe, Catherine. Right. Uh, Ted, Ann, are you writing this down, Ted? No, but I, I'll remember it. <laughs> okay. Robert, Kate, Mark. Okay, okay, easy enough. So Tony, Lisa, Gabe are first. Okay. okay. Tony, we'd like to hear what you have to say. Go, Tony, go. Okay, I, I don't want to be first, but that's all that's You're you first. Speak your name. Okay. All right. So... I have to say that, of course, when this all started and the year right in my head, it's like, what a great time to have extra writing time. And of course, there's been none. It's been worse than usual, right? Absolutely. Uh, zero. Yeah. yeah. So I had, you know, so I know I've read some short stories. This is kind of, this is a short story. I, it's, you know, I should, I'm not even going to, I'm just going to read it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say that I didn't have enough time to work the things I wanted to work. So I had hoped for something a little bit maybe better or maybe different stepping away from this kind of writing. But um, but I'll... No excuses. No excuses. No, no excuses. excuses. Anne's right. I no. think this is just part of her, of part of the bit. It's like very postmodern. Nicely done. Yeah, We're outside the frame. Didn't you say this last year too, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I make like a point of order real quick? Okay annoying from teaching and stuff um on zoom could we mute everybody but tony while she's reading yes good and call then, kate and then just as like a cool thing to do to make this as typewriter factory as possible i can't hear you i muted you <laughs> <laughs> to make this as typewriter factory as possible maybe then we could also um if you go up in the right hand side of your screen and hit speaker view, then it will just be Tony's face, you know, that you look nice. at and not everybody. Oh, that's nice too. Yeah. Listen yeah. to Kate. Um, that's right. Oh, oh my God, I'm seeing Kate now. Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. <sighs> All right. I, maybe I'll, well, no. If I do that, I don't see I don't see the audience. Hmm. What do I want to see though, Kate? Hmm. I'll go back to gallery view. Feel like I have a real audience. It's weird to I, I don't know. Can I read sitting down? I okay. I'm gonna try. Okay. Thank you very much. And I hope you're all doing well. And this is so exciting that we're still doing this because I never thought we'd be able to pull it off. <laughs> so uh, the title of this piece is What Diamonds Can Buy. It's a small statue. It is Jesus as a child, but he wears a crown and is dressed in royal robes. In his left hand, he holds out a globe with a cross on the top, and his right hand is up with two fingers extended upward. He lived in the china cabinet, the top shelf, but to the right of the door so that he was visible when they were closed. Many Catholic countries have developed spirit, <clears throat> special spiritual significance to this icon. It's usually called the Infant Jesus of Prague. Some believe you can bury it to bring about good weather for a wedding. For us, though, it explained why we had lived in our house. Our Jesus of Prague, Prague had a small ring that was placed over his head and lay around his neck. It was a diamond engagement ring elegant, not a showy stone, and some small ones circling it. When he had to be moved, when we needed the china, Helen and I would sneak away with the statue. 
Look, it almost fits me, Helen said, putting the ring on her index finger. It doesn't go on that one. It's the one next to the pinky, I said. And you can't take that one. Mom said it has to stay on Jesus. Let me try. Great. Now the house is probably going to burn down and it's all your fault, Anthony said, standing in the doorway. You can't take the ring off the statue. Put it back or we'll all die. Shh, stop it. We'll put it back. Only mom can't wear diamonds. Helen handed me the ring. That was the promise. Not all of us. I'll get a huge one from my husband, much bigger than this, and I'll have a bigger house too. Make me laugh. Who'd marry you? I held the ring in my palm, studying it, but did not put it on my finger. I handed it back to Helen, and we pushed past Anthony. Before mom even noticed, Jesus with the diamonds was back in the china cabinet. <laughs> Many years earlier, the ring was in a box in Stan's pocket. He was standing on the corner near Marshall Fields. He was early to meet Renee, so he tried to relax, but he kept running his finger around the smooth, small box, tracing its edges. In his head, he tried to practice the speech that he had planned. Was it right? Was he positive? Yes, yes, he repeated to himself. He loved her, but love was different now. Everything had changed. How could it not? The whole world was different, like a gray mist settled over it. Not enough to choke you, just enough to make it all seem a little less clear. They had met at Dan and Margaret's wedding. Stan was the best man and Renee one of the bridesmaids. Dan had mentioned her, obviously a ploy by Margaret to pair them off. Stan was used to it, people trying to play matchmaker. When he had returned from the war, the categories of people were set. There were people who served and survived, came back physically or mentally damaged, and when they returned, some just slipped back into their lives, their loves, their families. Others were faced with the casualty of the separation. What they expected to come back to was gone. No Dear John letter to prepare you, just a stiffened hug, a dry cheek kiss, and an awkward confession. That's what he faced. But it actually was not so awful. Genevieve's, Genevieve's betrayal fit with what he thought about the world. He had gone from hopeful hero to a shattered man facing the worst horrors of humanity. When people asked him how was how it was, what he saw, he answered politely with some cliched answers about what they expected. But in his head, yes, in his head, he saw it all again. He smelled it, he gagged, he screamed. In his head, he said to them, I smelled burning flesh and looked into the cavernous faces of those who survived hell. I gagged on the putrid stench created when the living and the dying were smothered together. When they left their prisons, most barely walking, leaning on the soldiers or each other, they had no tears, no cries of pain. He heard only the sounds that wounded animals might make if they were freed from flesh tearing traps. And he and the other soldiers stood and had to face it. And there would never be a way to fully describe it, unthinkable. Stan kept this all in his head when people asked, but it made him hate. A small ball of hate grew in his chest. So when Jen broke his heart, oh, so she, or so she thought, he told her it was going to be okay. In his head, he thought, my heart died there in Germany. It is gone. No use pretending it would still work with her or anyone else. Then there were the people at home who fell into the same types of categories. For the people, mostly women, they faced men coming back injured physically and mentally. They tread lightly and worried about the future of their loved ones. Could we just go forward and pretend none of it happened? Could we find ways to live with the missing limbs, the pain, the anger? They had hope because even if they couldn't admit it, they felt better off than those others, those who lost people. They had it much worse. As everyone around them celebrated the end of the war, they were forced to look around. Where was he? How did he die? What would the future have been for us? Renee was one of those. She had loved Jack in a way that she had thought was only in stories. He was tall, tall with sandy brown hair and green eyes that stared deeply. When he looked at you, you felt it. They had met at a graduation party at the Polish Alliance Hall on the west side. She was a good dancer and was always out on the floor. She noticed him staring at her, but he never came up to her, never asked for a dance. He sat with a group of boys from St. Thomas at the table on the edge of the floor. Just sat there, and when the last song was over, he finally approached Renee as she was going to get her jacket. You like to dance, huh? He said, stepping in front of her path to the table. No, no, not at all. Why would you say that? She grinned. And at first he looked hurt, then he laughed. And you don't, huh? 
He shrugged, but he somehow attached himself to her from that day forward. It was a year whirlwind of good times, love, fun, until he had to go. He asked her to marry him when he got back, but it was so precarious. A ring that was his grandmother's was on her finger. They could barely be joyful, and Renee wrote letters and prayed, but deep in her heart, she had this awful sadness as if she knew. After they got word that he was killed, that not enough of his body was available for a proper burial, she sunk into the ground with him. When friends took her out, when they told her it would be okay someday, when all those soldiers returned and her green-eyed love did not, her heart turned to dust. So at the wedding, when Stan was supposed to get to know Renee, they both saw that the other had parts missing. Hearts disfigured by a world of suffering and pain, losses of humans and humanity, and by spending time together, they got their friends to stop worrying to get them back to some normal. They could go out with the couples, their friends, and stop people from worrying about them or trying to fix them up. Who knows how <clears throat> who knows how two broken hearts somehow touched each other, but they did. They realized about six months after the, that it felt as if their broken pieces could fit into a completed picture. It was not the future they had expected, but they both seemed to be able to finally look beyond. Now a year later, Stan stood waiting for Renee with the diamond ring in a box. He was nervous, but he knew Renee would probably say yes. They had found a way to see a way forward, even though they were still two people moving in a gray shadowed world. Renee and Stan, <clears throat> sorry. Renee and Stan lived in a flat above her parents after they married. She was pregnant and she hated the small one bedroom apartment. It was not the size, it was not even the old furniture they had put in the rooms. It was her mother. She could not stand the sound of her calling upstairs the second Stan left for work. If Renee made an excuse and called down that she was busy or tired, within minutes she would hear her mother's slow steps coming up. Then her mother would bounce between complaining about everything, Renee's father, her husband, her cleaning, and rearranging, cleaning, or cooking. Renee tried to remember the mother that she had loved, and she loved her father, but this was not supposed to be her life. She was ready to be an adult to live at least a bit away from them. She knew they had made the right decision to move into the flat and save money to buy a house, but Stan got to leave every day. Since she got pregnant and was let go from the store, she was stuck. Just, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and her choices most days were to go downstairs and see her dad and negotiate her mom there or sit on her couch and absorb the blows. And she knew once the baby came, it would be worse. Her mother would take over and she couldn't seem to stop it. So one day as her mother rearranged the shelves, the infant of Prague statue they got as a wedding gift caught her eye. There was a place to go for help. She started to pray every night to his, uh, with his cherubic, cherubic face in mind and one night it came to her. She put her engagement ring on the statue and Stan laughed at her. She promised she would never wear diamonds again if she, find a, if she could find a house for her children, a house where she could be the mother. Then a month later, the nun's house, the one they passed when they walked to St. Jones was up for sale. The church was building a real convent next to the school, so they were selling it. It was closer to her parents than she had hoped and the price was a touch high, but Renee could not let it go. They juggled the numbers. It had to happen, she told Stan. We will cut the budget. It did. They got the nun's house and Jesus got the diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Gosh, I All really right. like that one. Oh, great. Tony. That was one of my favorites from you. Oh, thank you, Mark. Thank yeah. You. Oh, yeah. Sad and happy all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You know, Tony, I want to say one of my favorite things you do is your dialogue with siblings is always so excellent. It really is. Every time you write sibling dialogue, it is so well done and like so authentic. You can tell that you have them. <laughs> but like, it's, it's, no, matter, like no matter the time right. period, you know, that you're writing in that piece you did right. from the 60s in Detroit, yeah. like, but if they're just, it's so good. And it's always my favorite part. Like, I just <laughs> love it. No, it's, it, yeah, I agree. It's really nice. And it's very clear that your siblings were nothing like mine. <laughs> <laughs> totally different dialogue there would be. Yeah. 
I feel like it's in a workshop. I just needed to say that anyway. <laughs> no, thank you. That's great. Yes, I, I guess we did. We taught, yeah. <laughs> We're still like that today, even when we now Zoom with each other because everyone's in a different city. I think the three of us uh, really, you know, uh, so anyway. Well, thank you. So I think, it, shall I go to the next person or is Ted going to come back on and speak? Well, we've hired Ted to host. Ted, you're muted, baby. You're okay. muted. Okay. Oh, Ted, you're okay. like muted, man. Un unmute yourself, Ted, and then I will mute. So you can introduce the lovely Lisa Kreiser. Up Here next. I am. Here I am. All right. Uh, okay, so our next, uh, our next reader is Lisa Kreiser, the amazing Lisa Kreiser. Uh, so lay it on us, Lisa. Okay, hi guys. Hi. Um, so I have, all right, I'm not gonna make any excuses, um, but like Tony said, I as I was trying to work on something, I was like, why did I agree to do this? This is like the worst. <laughs> Because I just wasn't, nothing was coming to me and anything that was coming to me was like just so dark and ugh. So um, I've been writing, um, last time I read poems and I've got two short little poems again. Um, so I just can't, I don't know, I don't know really what's going on, but I'm just not, um, no stories are coming to me lately. Everything's just kind of coming to me in these little images. So um, I've just got two little short pieces and... They still, you know, I'd still like to work on them, but they're what I came up with. So here we go. Oh, and my computer connection's awful. So if I go out, let me know. All right. This one's called Imagine a Boat. Imagine you're on a boat. No, not one with sails or oars or anything like that. One that creaks and shifts and tears your bare feet with its splinters. Okay, never mind. Picture a house. Not the kind that glows with welcoming light, but one you sit in front of in your car, balancing minutes before someone notices. No, instead, maybe think of yesterday, but not the yesterday with first spring breezes, the yesterday when ants push their way through every loosened theme of every tattered room. What if there was a memory, more of a snap, a flat image of someone who looked at you once, not directly, mind you, but in your general direction. Would you see that glance as golden, as enough to carry mattresses through tiny entryways and sick children into emergency rooms? Or would you recognize it as a reflection, your own idea of what should be? That's the first one. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And the second one, um, when I worked for um, the literary magazine at Bowling Green, uh, we had a competition every year called the uh, Fine Line Competition. And it was called Fine Line because it was looking for pieces that were a fine line between a prose poem and a short short. So it were, we, you know, we only took, I think, uh, it was 500 words max, or I, I'm not sure, but it was, it was a really cool competition because there's, there's this, there are these things, you know, that are prose poems, but are they short shorts, you know, and it's this weird kind of um, hybrid in between. So that's kind of what I feel like this, this second one is. And um, I wrote this because I was thinking about, you know, Gabriel and water and every time he reads pieces, you know, all of the ocean imagery that comes to mind. And so um, this is lake imagery. <laughs> Not oceans, but um, water nonetheless. So, Gabriel, this was my piece for you. Thank this you. is called Underwater. I've been caught underwater. I've been caught underwater more than once. My cousin reminds me that when I was two, he pulled me from underneath the lake and dragged me across the sand to my mother. There was a time at the water park when a lifeguard, barely older than I was, had to reach down and grab my hair breaking me free from the swirl I was stuck in, her terrified face backlit by the summer sun as my lungs filled, finally found air. And the very last time I swam in waves, stuck in an undertow one summer up north, my foot slipping and slipping against the sand, no sense of up, a hand snatching at my suit, yanking me towards light. My, grandfather, my grandmother couldn't swim, 
She stayed on the shore my whole childhood. But she told this story once of falling off a concrete pier downtown when she was a young woman. She said she sank straight down to the bottom of Lake Michigan, eyes wide the entire time watching the lights of the city fade below the dark water. She claims she touched bottom and felt the earth beneath her shoes. I imagine her delicate feet balancing on the well-packed grains of sand, a whisper of weight in the silent darkness. She says she just walked out. No one jumped in behind her. No fingers dug into the flesh of her arm to pull her back to safety. She just slowly moved one foot in front of the other and made her way up the slope of shore until she broke the water's surface alone and strong. I imagine her emerging, held, head held high, a stoic force of calm. Her hair is perfect. She is ready for anything. The end. <laughs> that was it. Thank you guys. <laughs> Very nice. Nice. Yeah, I love yeah. that last one. Yeah. Thanks. Right on. That I'm, was great, Lisa. Oh, what a beautiful piece. I love that. Thank you. I'm supposed to, I forgot I'm introducing the next one. So, Gabe, it's all you. Okay, I, I hope my pups don't um, bark. I had put them in the kennels, but then I let them out and someone had the temerity to walk down the street. Anyways, <clears throat> so I have um, two prose pieces and two poems. Um, this first one is... Um, <sighs> prompted, let's say, by a video I saw on YouTube. Um, and uh, the, the details are mine. They were not in the video. <clears throat> it's called Healing. She did not want to open her eyes. She had lain down because she didn't want to be awake and had fallen into a deep sleep. She knew she should get up but her body weighed a thousand pounds. She couldn't move her arms or legs. She didn't want to. Then the vortex again, pain, vacuum, dark, fast, slow, red, black, turning, turning in the pit, in the pit of the stomach, sapping all the energy in her body, deep, dark. She wanted to sleep, not get up. She was tired of being told to do this or that, to cheer up, to keep her mind busy. Her mind was busy. On days like today, it was dark, musty, foggy, and the only, and she only wanted to lie down and not be awake. Then came the other vortex that accompanied somnolence, that inevitable bliss that took her to a different reality, uh, always a better one, where she mingled with people and strange things happened. Eventually, she woke up and had to stay awake. When she was up and about, she was afraid. Afraid of people and their reactions. Afraid of being verbally attacked. Afraid of others' disapproving looks. She'd rather be alone, but not necessarily lying down, giving in to the vortex. It was a misty morning when she went for a walk in the woods behind her house and found a lane that wound among the trees. A smell in the air let her know that she was close to a farm, and then she heard them. The shrill treble of a neigh, and the answer to that neigh. She loved horses. She spit up and through the trees she saw Rosie. A very slim white horse in a muddy pen was stretching her neck under the barbed wire trying to nibble a meager patch of grass just beyond her reach. Elaine was horrified. She knelt down, grabbed a clump of grass and fed it to the emaciated horse. Elaine felt tears rolling down her cheeks. The horse was so thin and so hungry. Inside a large stall there were more horses. She jumped over the fence onto the muddy pen caressed the velvety side of the white horse, whom she had already named Rosie, feeling her huge ribs stick out from an otherwise smooth surface. As she entered the stall, Elaine saw two more horses, equally emaciated, stepping on a filthy mix of mud and old straw, no food in sight. 
These horses, one gray, one brown, looked ill. They needed attention. But whom did they belong to? Who was keeping them in such conditions? There was no time for questions, though. She had to do something. Back home, Elaine looked up the number of the closest humane society and dialed it without any hesitation. After about 10 minutes, a regional horse rescue operation had promised to take action. It's funny how the human mind works. Now, she didn't feel like lying down or escaping wakefulness. There was no vortex inside, no darkness. She sat in her living room feeling both sad and angry at the same time. Sadness and angry were not usual feelings for her. Somehow, they felt good. They felt healthy. She had energy running through her body. A few days later, she received a phone call from the horse rescue shelter asking her if she would be willing to help with the rescue of the three horses that she had reported emaciated and sick. The local police would be there as well. The horses proved to be severely underfed and in need of medical attention. The horse rescue shelter would restore these horses to health. Elaine knew that she wanted to be part of the horse's recovery, but her crippling anxiety took over her voice and she did not dare speak the words. Her eyes, however, communicated more loudly than her words with the spoken. Karen from the horse rescue shelter asked Elaine if she would like to visit the horses every day to help them along the path to health. For three months, Elaine drove to the horse shelter every afternoon and stood by the stables eager to greet the beasts. Big, strong beasts they were, with large eyes and as much emotion in them as Elaine had seen in anybody. They greeted Elaine with joy and let her caress and talk to them. Elaine loved the time she spent with Rosie, Silver, and Stan. She experienced no anxiety, no vortex, no darkness. It was all pure joy and the warmth that comes from the company of friends, of those who will not hurt us. During these three months, Elaine never once laid down to run away from life, to give herself up to the pulling darkness of the vortex in the page of her stomach. In fact, no such pain lodged itself in her at all. She went about her daily activities and looked forward to the late afternoon when she would meet her friends, those she knew would not betray her. This was by no means the end of her lifelong struggle, struggle with depression. She knew that. But now she also knew that she had hope, that if she had been able to defeat the vortex that once sapped her desire to live, she could do it again and again. My second piece, thank you. Um, um, at the last reading, um, Lisa mentioned the um, bad poetry context. Um, <clears throat> so um, I wrote two poems, um, one that I meant to be serious and one that I think would be a good candidate for the bad poetry contest. And I'll let you decide which is which. Uh, the first one's called Only Yesterday. Only yesterday is what we say. Our minds waft back into the hazy netherworld of youth, memories past, those issues forever unresolved. Yet we are here now, gray, flabby, slow. We cherish our bodies, that's all we have. All we have left that ties us to the planet. Our minds are wild, they have no bounds. They don't know flabby, weak, achy, slow. We travel back and forth, we move like a sprite. We're here today, next we're a child. We're a teen right after. Grandma is still alive, alive in us, alive and thriving, loving, caring. She glows, she nurtures and protects. We are timeless. When we close our eyes at night, we are transported. We are that child again that was loved or scolded or battered. The love is here. The pain isn't gone. The nurturer loves 
the abuser hits, the pervert stings. We are the child we always were in that surreal world where walls are water, where everything morphs into a different state. The abuser is a viper. The viper turns to mud, we run and run looking back, but all we see is mud, water, land, sun. The viper's gone. Now we fly across the land, our bodies are immaterial. Our bodies are slow, flabby, gray and white as the sun comes up. And Morpheus releases us from his woozy embrace. We no longer make plans to grow, succeed, develop, and enlarge. We plan the path so that it is smooth and quiet, peaceful, joyful, full of love with those around us, those still with us. We cherish, love, appreciate. We strive, persevere, continue. We see the end. And yet we know that this last lane will be the best. A quiet, joyful path full of the bliss we long for when we started our journey so many, many moons ago. Um, and uh, thank you. My next poem. Hey. Why have we heard more poetry from you? <laughs> <laughs> right? I was just thinking that. Where has this been all my life? In fact, I wrote these pieces. Um, I know. The balcony of, of Caldo in uh, Cabo San Lucas during the winter break. So I couldn't focus on this while I'm grading. But anyways, the next one is called The Many Ages of Wu Man. We play, we play in limbo. Oh, we play forever and ever as we grow wild till one day the mighty one in a roaring voice will say, it's time you stop the stupid stuff. Be born, you silly child. And so we pop out of mother's womb into this cruel world. We pee, we poo straight to the tomb. We journey with our sails unfurled. Oh love, oh bliss to be a baby, to crawl, to babble, to drool. Some pups will soon go join the Navy, and others will just be poor. From pup to teen, what is the fuss? We crawl, we play, we rut. Mom thinks, what's wrong with us? Dad wants to kick our butt. We are now mature, enough to college go. Dad smiles. He is sure he's now sure. But mom says no, oh no. We study, rut and date, we walk, we crawl, we sprawl. <laughs> Mary, whelp, we gape. We have a pup. Now we can brawl. From pup, the offspring grows. Now he's a feisty team. We see our first furrows that had remained unseen. Our hair grows gray, our muscles saggy. The pups just go away. We are now all grown, all old and baggy. From gray to white, from saggy to limp, our body's flight is as fast as an imp. As grandpas, we dare call the new pups fluff. Pups don't care. We are white, decrepit stuff. The Almighty once again speaks out while we enjoy old age. We wonder why he calls out loud that sounds like fun and rage. He's having fun, he's feeling, he's feeling bold. He makes us smell the oak. We know we're good, we know we're old, and so he makes us croak. That is so rude. All right, and uh, Twas Brillig. <laughs> <laughs> and the slidey toes. Excellent. All right, and my last piece is um, my coda. It's called the Wine and Cheese Party. Hey, uh, Ted, don't forget to mute yourself because then it keeps flashing to you while Gabriel's reading. It's super weird. All right, okay, hold on. <laughs> it was a professional yet a Ted informal gathering, a wine and cheese party. The cheese and wine were of superb quality. The wheel of cheese had been carved in the extravagant shape of a swan. 
the wine must have been good, but at that young age, I was not, I was really not a wine lover. Despite my young years, I had just turned 20. I had been asked to cut the cheese. Yes, I cut the cheese. I had that honor because I was the youngest teacher in the school at the time. 10 years earlier, I had sat in those classrooms, a small young kid eager to learn, a nerd in the making. Most of my teachers over the years since then were now my colleagues at the wine and cheese party. My first week of classes, my first one ever, marked what was going to be the rest of my teaching years, the joy of being in the classroom, the joy of witnessing growth and learning day by day. This joy fueled my spirit. In those days of chalkboards and flashcards printed in black and white, I taught third and fourth graders, those eight to 10 year old little kids that learned by playing are now in their fifties. Time for a new paragraph. We played during most of the class, punctuated with brief presentations of new material. Today we hear such catchy bandwagon terms as gamification. However, before the days of computers and video games, we played games in the classroom. Playing is how children applied the new concepts that they learned. Time passed, and one day someone else was the youngest teacher in the school but she didn't get to cut the cheese. I was now teaching higher level courses and a wider variety of students. By now, I was piloting new teaching methods and groundbreaking textbooks. I have, I have always enjoyed the thrill of trying new approaches, experimenting with new theories and, practicing, and practices of teaching and learning and using technology in the classroom. Back in the early 80s, that meant trying new teaching methods that not only did away with presentations of new material, but also incorporated video lessons in the traditional classroom. The VCRs of the time were as big as a suitcase with a VHS tape holder popping up from the top of the VCR and gaping at you, menacing, hungry for a tape. I must say that teaching the highest level courses with the cutting edge technology of the time gave me the most satisfaction. Watching the students who started out with timid attitudes and subdued performance gain skills, confidence, and knowledge. And now it's time for disclosures. I am right when I say that I have been in the classroom for 42 years. Yet I have taught for only 40 of those years. When I got to Ohio University to pursue my master's program, I had a generous grant by Fulbright, which precluded me from earning my keep. They were providing me with a generous grant to get me through my master's program. During my first year of that program, I was glad to have all day to study and also party a bit. After all, I was not even 30 yet. My first year at Ohio University was great. Linguistics in the classroom, linguists for friends, linguistics jokes with those friends, linguist parties quite often. The second year though was a different story. I got the itch. I wanted to teach. However, my grand precluded my teaching so I had to wait yet another year till I could teach again. As I started my PhD program at Purdue University at the end of the 80s, I would earn my keep teaching for the English department. At first, I taught freshman composition, chalk in hand, red pen ready. It was still the 80s after all. As soon as the new decade rolled in, Purdue's computing facilities went from being a withered seed to becoming a lush, colorful, exotic plant full of flowers. Computer labs popped up everywhere, including in our building. Many of us became monitors in those new computer labs that, have that had been massive TA's offices, while the English department claimed those labs as its territory. That was to change though. In those early days of computer abundance, we did not distinguish a computer lab 
from a computer classroom. We experimented with open classrooms and incorporating computers into our traditional classrooms. Teaching at Purdue University and at Ivy Tech, Indiana, in the early 90s was fuel for my soul. It kept me going through the grueling routine of coursework, prelims, prospectus, and dissertation. The English department at Purdue encouraged experimentation, and I found myself both encouraged and supported by the department chair, called department head at Purdue, to implement in the classroom those ideas that came out of my cauldron. The result was fantastic. I thought and taught outside the box. I put radical thoughts into action in my teaching. Yes, radical as in Paulo Freire's ideas. I got kudos for all that. Teaching business writing, a 400 level course, populated mostly by seniors was both a challenge and my treasure. Those seniors, most of them business majors from Cranard School of Business, were about to graduate. The word cocky does not do honor to some of those students' attitudes. I can still see the student in front of me telling me, I want to name this class. I can still hear my response, earn it. Towards the end of my TA, my TA years at Purdue, at which time I was a graduate instructor by the fact that I had already passed my prelims, I had been anointed a veteran business writing instructor and a leader in innovation in that program. I was the linguist that led rhetoricians in the business writing program. Looking back, I see that Purdue was an eggshell. It kept me in the safety of its bounds, safely nestled in its warm community, both academic and social. And yet it was time for me to break out of that shell and venture out into the world. In the mid nineties, I was hired at MCC. My teaching experience, my experience with computers in the classroom, and my experience with diversity in the student body. I had been a research assistant for the Multicultural Affairs Office for a year, got me here. They needed someone who could step into a computer classroom and teach freshman composition to a diverse student body without prior teaching. Those computer classrooms ran 286s and 386s respectively. For ye who do not remember what those were, what those were, the 286 and the 386 were to the computers we use today, what the Model T was to today's Ford Explorer. Just like Purdue did in the 1990s, MCC joined the computer revolution in the late 1990s. And before we knew it, we were offering online courses. As the millennium rolled over and before the term LMS was even heard. A handful of us, the Adventurers Four, Chuck, Lillian, Irwin, and I, developed and offered online courses. I offered the first section of English 151 online on a WebCT 3.0 platform. After English 151, I developed English 152 online, this time on Blackboard, to which we had just subscribed. The years went on. Blackboard to Angel, Angel to Canvas, 386s to PCs, PCs to thin clients, <laughs> excuse my language. The generations also changed. Generation X gave way to Generation Y. The children of Generation Xers are our current millennials. I remember participating in discussions about how to motivate our Generation X, then our Generation Y students, the current millennials can only be motivated when they lift their eyes from the cell phones. After 42 years in the classroom, now that my first students back in the late 70s are in their 50s, I pause. I take a deep breath and look back with satisfaction. I've made it. Then, prosperous like, I take my staff and break it. But before I do that, a user, I use it to conjure up for myself a pair of big and strong wings. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Man, Gabriel, I can't, you know, the fact you said Chuck, 
Yeah, some name Erwin dropping. And Erwin. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that is that is going deep <laughs> into the chronicles. Yeah, and into the catacombs. <laughs> yeah. I have to that I had to I couldn't remember Erwin Cornelia's name. Oh, yeah. Remember his face, his obsession with Max. I had to ask Peter Lilly if he could remember his name, and then, of course, Pete remembered it. That is crazy. I can picture his face, Gabriel. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got her with Cornelius. Wow. Yeah. Really nice, man. I'm so glad you did that. And I love the way you wrapped that up. Beautiful. Yeah, that was nice. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, hey, okay. Gabriel, what year did you come here, by the way? 1995. Okay, I thought I heard that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And how many years have you clocked teaching total? Um, I started on March 15th, 1978. Holy shit, Gabriel. I did not know that. Wow. wow. I was, I was, a, I was um, not even 20 yet. But uh, they needed teachers, and I was a junior in college, and then the laws allowed that someone who's a junior in a, a teacher's college uh, can teach when there's a need for teachers and teachers are not available. Wow. Okay. Wow, man. I tell you, brother, that's a career. Oof. Yeah, that is. Lots oh, of people. Oh, you've earned it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, shall we move on to our next, and then we'll all talk again. Uh, we have Catherine. You're going to make me follow Gabe? I am. Catherine Gray, you shall follow. Besides, you got such a groovy, rustic, I don't know, cozy background. Oh, wow, look at that. Damn, shit. All right, I'm going to sign off because, you know, Kate is going to get on me if I don't. Okay, um, I guess I'll do an internet warning too. We live out in the boonies, and so my internet is spotty at best. So um, mine's on a Word file, so I'm going to pull it up and... Um, I am a mama, so all my stuff comes from kid stuff, and I've been trapped at home with them. <laughs> trapped. I use the word trapped. Um, I've been home with them for uh, about six consecutive weeks, leaving only to go to the grocery store. So this is, I guess, a little bit where this is coming from. Um, during this current pandemic, I have been starting most mornings by offering my kids choices of what our activity will be. My options of new things within our house are waning, but today I offered we can make Play-Doh or go outside or wash the kitchen floor with special scrubbies. Resoundingly, my daughter responded that she wanted to wash the floor. She then asked if she could clean the rest of the house when we were done. She is my helper most of the time, but maybe I take advantage of that a bit too much. A letter to my oldest child. My dear oldest child, you are my firstborn, my first little helper. There are many chores that we enjoy doing together, washing laundry, putting away clothes, clearing the table, picking up your toys, and your favorite, washing the floor. When your brother came along, again, you wanted to help. You had extra responsibilities now. You had to set a good example for him and teach him how to do so many things. Go get mama a diaper. Put those toys up high so the baby can't reach them. Can you help him take his shoes off? Mama's hands are messy. Can you help him pull his pants back up? Avery, don't be so bossy. Don't yell at him. He is trying. Let him do it. You are not the parent. I ask for your help. I encourage you to teach him and show him how. I want you to be best friends and great playmates since we struggled to entertain ourselves trapped in our home during the pandemic. But you are not in charge of him. Wait, what was that noise? Go see what Hunter's doing. You get frustrated when he wants to do whatever you are doing. He wants to read princess books and play in your room just to be with you. He looks up to you and follows the example you set for him. As we play in the yard, he asks for you the moment he loses sight of you while you dig for worms under a tree. As he tries to play, your bossy side starts to come out when you are not satisfied with what he is doing. Avery, let him do it. Stop telling him what to do. He's trying. 
you are not the parent. You are testing boundaries. You are getting older and more mature. You want your own private space. You don't want him in your room anymore, but you always want to play in his room. You take his toys and hide them in your room. I scolded you and told you that if you couldn't be, if he couldn't be in your room, then maybe you couldn't come in his room anymore. A conversation we have had several times. You reminded me with tear filled eyes of the times that I have sent you to his room to help. Avery, can you put this in Hunter's laundry basket? Avery, will you go turn the light off in Hunter's room? Avery, go help Hunter get dressed. Fama will get up in just a minute as I lay in bed, not ready to start the day. Mama is an oldest child too. I remember feeling responsible for a sibling and then younger cousins. I recognize that my relationship with my brother and my cousins is not always the friendship relationship that I see your dad have with his siblings. I feel a responsibility to take care of others. Am I creating that relationship paradigm again with you and your brother? I cannot eliminate the need for you to, to help me or your younger brother, but perhaps I need to strive to put less responsibility on your small shoulders in terms of his care. Then again, I love the idea of you two feeling a need to look out for one another as I know you will both be in school full time in a few short years. So for now, Go check on your brother. That's it. Thank you, thank you. I'm bossy and she's mine. <laughs> Very nice, Catherine. Thank you. Makes me want to cry a little. Oh, oh don't cry. <laughs> cry, Tony, cry. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, I can so relate. I'm the oldest too and I see that in my oldest and even in my middle with yeah. my list because she takes care of the little one yeah <laughs> I'm the oldest and I'm a girl and I have a younger brother and then I I have an oldest girl with a younger brother and I'm setting them up to be just like me and my brother I think but. it's always so fascinating to me because I'm an only child and an only grandchild <laughs> so all of these relationships are so foreign <laughs> like See, and I have cousins on my mom's side that are about, they're six years or more younger than me. And so sometimes my relationship with them is more like niece and nephew because I was always in charge of them. So it's not a cousin. We're not friends. I'm, I'm in charge of you. And I always was. Char, are you like on another magical planet? Your background is like beautiful. <laughs> what is that I mean, this <laughs> I mean, this really like terrible it's, corner. It's the over here. It's not. <laughs> I'm in this terrible, terrible corner that has like a big dead bug smudge on the wall. <laughs> so, but it has great light. <laughs> so I hide it. It looks that, great. Really? I'm jealous. That looks like a, a dead, beautiful dragonfly. <laughs> it looks much better than the big dead centipede smudge that's on me right behind me. And I'm too lazy to clean no. up the wall. <laughs> Every time Star speaks, I feel so happy just looking at her, <laughs> <laughs> her background. Uh, okay, that was great. It's a. Uh... Oh, it's me. Someone <laughs> now, Ted. Don't mute yourself. <laughs> all right. Can you all see me? Am I like on your screen? Am I? Am I there? Okay. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, uh, I've got all new, new poetry. Um, I, actually, I gotta say, I've uh, been fairly productive. And um, it's, again, you know, there's like a new, a new voice. I swear every year I say this, but I think being home, um, I, I've been writing these poems that are kind of either lyrical meditations or very fantastical they're they're almost um i i don't know how to describe them uh, just fantasy supernatural sort of uh fanciful so um i'll start off with a couple of the smaller ones that are just sort of like i said these little meditations this is called silver skating on spring soft mornings I like to sit on old chairs 
as if a seed of history through some prevarication ended up on my blue porch overlooking frozen time. I close my eyes and call, Marie, Marie, fetch my silver skates. Between the looking glass trees, we glide and listen like bent penitents for just one syllable of God and slowly recognize the voices we always took for birds. It's called the Song of the Seal. It is time to stop the smallness, I think, reclining on my porch step and looking north between the red sails of prairie grass at sunset like a gentleman captain. Wishing I'd come into this world through doorways of rough planks, a briny wind fast following, the murmured voices kept for working days like pipes and pockets coming from a parlor of polished velvet. A life of sea light, dark horizons, practice violence, and music by driftwood fires when seals, blue luminescence, stand on serpent heads and sing. Something, uh, lately, I've been writing poems just based on something I happen to read, little tidbits. Um, and this is one of them. It's called Alexander's Gift. Someone lit a corner of a rumor that Alexander brought back a little gift from his vacation for Aristotle. He wanted to surprise his teacher, whose sleight of hand released the ghost inside a book. Imagine, studying a pomegranate seed to understand translucent atoms reclined on sun-splashed steps of a temple seldom visited, the plate of figs and cup of wine beneath a simple cloth to keep the flies off just within reach. In blessed stillness, a patient rapture, when unraveling thoughts expose the heart of mystery. But then he hears the laughing shouts and raises two eyes like buckets from the well, to see his people marching in their fool's parade. And at the front, a lion's jaws enfolding his perfect brow with that ridiculous grin the master never could uncouple from his pupil's fate. Ares, he sang out their private joke. Look what I brought you. And the mournful beast Alexander sat atop, beribboned, draped in decorated robes, with large and painted eyes on each quivering ear, just like a sail, he thought, gazed at the old philosopher as if he were a child. And in the same sort of vein, uh, again, something I read, this was um, something I've been doing too since I've been home is like opening every book I own and I just sort of wander around the house and I'm like, oh. and I'm finding all these art books I forgot I had. And I came across a book on Titian. And I read just a little uh, fact about something he proclaimed about painting and um, kind of ran with it. Titian's law. Uh, Titian, the 16th century uh, painter. To truly paint a world, Titian believed three colors only mattered red and black and white. That's lucky. As the red-winged blackbird balances on a snow-tipped foil of grass, like Marlena Dietrich in her dapper suit and crimson lipstick, regarding me with white-knuckled fear like anyone who's seen what they wish to unsee. There's plenty left in poetry's ransacked attic for me to rummage through. Hamlet's favorite skull on a dirty edge after all the fighting's done. That memorable spot beside the raven lock on clean embroidered lace and foaming waves like small applause where armies clash by night. My old cigar box has its treasures too. A polished red button with a few stray threads like delicate black legs, precious as a pearl. One queen of hearts, her sword twit, 
their sword tip singed a bit. And my prize, the piece of sea glass, white as milk, with a solitary dot of black like a mermaid's beauty mark. I hold against my bedside light to see a sailor's dawn. Next, a poem I read in honor of Gabriel. Mm. Woo, that's right, the first. When persimmons fall from trees. You know, it's not another story nobody believes. The sudden stumbling on a bower where mortal desire has no place. I think it happened to my dog. He was a prince, I'm certain, and spent his idle days pressing fragrant fist into the softened ceiling wax of decrees. It probably unfolded like an exquisite pop-up book, the royal orchard of persimmons, a little too much power and an unsavory impulse. His watchers smoking alabaster pipes beneath the harem's window, a small collapse of bricks and promise of adventure. He must have said, I'm the prince, or let them eat cake, tearing his gold-threaded turban on a warning branch of blossoms like his mother's jeweled and cloying fingers. Then freedom, stench and sorrow, filth, fume, Wicked hearts, bent beggars and crafty children, eyes like sailors back from journeys best forgotten, sliding up his silken pantaloons, their hands like serpents slithering out from the basket of a dream. His heavy rings, rubies, sapphires, a jealous emerald, and prize of sultans, the widow stone they called God's pupil. He flung them all into the slippery street and his silver slippers, thin as dragonfly wings, flew off the perfumed feet when he stooped and leapt on scissoring legs. A different tongue, uncurling like a scroll of execution and lolling out elongating lips as he shouted, help, help me friends, I'm the prince, the prince. But when the little mercenaries tucking treasures underneath their rotting smocks glanced left and right, they little thought to hear another barking dog. <laughs> uh, yeah, how you, got, you guys, how you doing? You guys, you guys hanging cool? I, I'd like to drink to Gabriel, uh, if I might. Uh, you know, with a, a glass like Kay suggested, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Ted, you must see that my cat came immediately when you started reading poetry and is totally mesmerized by your voice. He doesn't hang out. You know, it's, I, I know what to say, uh, saucy, you know, it's, uh, He's it's, big it's, in the cat community. A lot of people don't know that. Um, okay, I don't have much more, you guys. Uh, I want to read, though, another kind of, uh, you know, fantastic poem, for lack of a better term. Uh, this is the most recent, as a matter of fact. And, um, you know, I've, it's funny, right? I, I used to think, uh, oh, you know, read your best poems. And somewhere along the way, I finally found that place where I'm like, no, I, I want to read the poems that I want to hear. And um, it's been a real pleasure tonight uh, because I just sort of let that drive me. Okay, this is called Sunday at the Goblin Market. In Goblin Market, a dream is easily procured. The stall along the left-hand side, three, maybe four down, beside a blind magician turning lead into yellow birds with silver beaks and platinum eyes. Beware the peacock wing purveyor who promises a flight into the sun and hide your booklet of imagination with its daydreams pressed like leaves between transparent pages. When the stroll and poem vendors carry baskets full of chipped and greasy rhymes 
and hawk their couplets like whips of licorice to sweeten the mind. But come and follow me through dirty tent flaps shaped like painted dragon claws to shop among the wares attractively arranged along these planks of shipwrecked timber, haunted, or so they say, when the buoy in the bay calls its sailors home. But please relax, take your time. Try gazing in each green bowl like a hatching thought. Pull out the phosphorus stone, shut your eyes and make a fist, then think your wish. The dream, a dollop from rivering time, will ripple outward to the edges of your life where only dust is found, receding memory, a name impressed within a stone. It is not returnable. There is no promise of exchange. So choose as well as possible. But if you still desire a consultation with the dream proprietor, then drop your pavement in a gilded box of human trash and gaze above it until the silver glass and <laughs> uh, so I'd like to uh, close out. Yeah, okay. I'm going to read one more. And, well, you know what? Yeah, okay. Yeah. One more. Uh, Gabriel, I have written a sonnet. About you, kind of, but <laughs> the idea that you're, you know, it was, you know, it's, I kept thinking of you and you're leaving and it was actually really difficult, uh, but I just hammered away at it. It's called Gabriel's Or. Do distant voices sing you out to sea? Erase the chalkboards, putting on your coat. And pocketing the jailer's watch, his key, and little book of rhymes a young man wrote. Does lost Atlantis ring its ancient bells for you alone to hear their ghostly peals, awakened from old slumbering spells of days spent shucking oysters for our meals? The time to drown your book of careful magic arrives. And on a prow, young Argos awaits. And in your mind, a map sublime and tragic reveals its secret caves and haunted capes. And in the creaking cabin, pipe in hand, you'll turn the pages of a book unplanned. And, uh... Awesome, awesome. <laughs> In my defense, I do say that um, obviously that uh, when I break my staff, and I was I know. <laughs> I was thinking, at least I'm not going back to Stratford upon Avon to live with Anne Hathaway. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, when you read that line, I was like, "Oh, excellent! We were in the same." <laughs> I've been thinking about All right. that. Hey. Hey guys, thanks for. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Anne said, no, "Oh man, a, no death poem." Damn, Anne. <laughs> Damn you, Anne. Uh, <laughs> okay, so next we have, if I'm not mistaken, Anne Humphrey. Am I correct? All right, here I go. This is it. I'm muting myself. Hang on. And you're going to mute yourself. Uh, I'm unmuting. I remembered just in time. Um, so for those of you who have not been to Typewriter Factory before, I always ask Ted not to read a death poem because I'm usually at least attempting something funny. And he often puts a death poem right there. And then I stand up and, you know, so thank you, Ted, uh, tonight. That was quite beautiful. And um, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Death is all over every one of those poems that I read. But, I, but it wasn't the overt death poem, perhaps, that we sometimes get. So, um, so I do try to write something funny. So uh, hopefully, 
And uh, this is called The Perfection of Imperfection. Um, and it starts with something I said two, three nights ago to my therapist. I said, so I've been watching Star Trek. And she laughed. And then I decided I would write about it for you. So I've been watching Star Trek. I started because the two most important men in my life are Trek fans and discuss Trek episodes and cite examples from Trek as comparisons or examples, et cetera. One has as a decision-making rubric simply, what would Captain Kirk do as opposed to what would Jesus do? Star Trek throws around a lot of interesting ideas related to sociology, biology, technology, and psychology, and complicates situations with political, logistical, and personal dynamics. Star Trek has elements of the Western with a military overlay and generates profound lessons in leadership and discipline and friendship. Why are there 13 Star Trek movies and over 700 television episodes over 50 years and three new series currently in production? Why? Because Star Trek has a wide net in terms of content, Star Trek has a lot to offer. But Star Trek is also quite bad, just bad. At times laughably, iconically bad. It isn't just the cheap sets, including styrofoam boulders, which are easily thrown and then bounce. It isn't just the overly dramatic shaft of light across the eyes in a close-up or the fight scenes which feature magically effective neck chops and pinches or William Shatner's often parodied, often punctuated, halting and punching pronunciation. The badness is far more profound than these surface matters, which could be dismissed as caused by budgetary or time constraints or a dated style. Because in most episodes, there are continuity and plotting errors. Just last night, in the famous episode one of season two of the original series, Amuk Time, the episode which introduced the Vulcan spawning ritual of Ponfar, only a few minutes in, I was asking, hey, didn't Spock know this was about to happen? It's every seven years, right? Wouldn't he have been able to ask for leave before the Enterprise was in the middle of this diplomatic mission? Then how could we have a story? Asked my Zoom movie companion. In Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, the end sequence the end sequence features the Enterprise using equipment for detecting gaseous anomalies. However, the ship which had just returned from a mission cataloging gaseous anomalies was nearby, but not the Enterprise. An earlier comment established that Excelsior was on this mission, and this misplaced detail led me to yell out, I know a gaseous anomaly when I see one. My tricky buddy was Shatner style incredulous. Are you saying that the screenwriter made a mistake? Yes, yes, the screenwriter made a mistake. Almost every screenwriter who ever worked on Star Trek as a Star Trek product made a mistake. And that is a lot of people. Caught up in the most complex of concepts and the highest of drama, smaller details like story structure and plot points got lost in the shuffle. But here is the lesson of Star Trek. These errors do not ruin Star Trek. The errors, in fact, make Star Trek. For a perfectionist, this is a major revelation. I love Star Trek, despite its obvious shortcomings. Even the writing errors I find somewhat charming. The vision and tone and message 
And yes, even the cheesy music and makeup and sets and costumes, it's all part of a larger whole, a cultural phenomenon, a world unto itself. Like my old smelly dog, Star Trek's limps and farts and drool make me love it more. Look, look what it does. It is predictable. The unnamed crewman always dies by the third scene, yet Spock revives after being solidly dead for days, every time. Yet, it is unpredictable. Why will the transporter die this week? How much time will Scotty guess when he says she'll hold a while? Answer, by the way, however much time the writers think they need for the action scenes they have in mind. Which profession will McCoy point out that he does not hold? Best so far, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Season one, episode 26, The Devil in the Deep. Astoundingly, this clarity, this vision of the perfection of imperfection is nothing less than a life-changing gift. The perfection of imperfection has altered my worldview, my personal paradigm. The perfection of imperfection frees me to write without fear, to boldly go. Thank you, Star Trek. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I've, been watching, I've been watching Star Trek. Yay. <laughs> we watch a lot of Star yeah, Trek man. in our house. And, <laughs> and have you ever heard uh, William Shatner's rendition of Mr. Tambourine Man? Yeah, I have. Yes. It's a classic. No, I I was telling, I was telling my friend that I heard years ago like a blockbuster video ad uh, where and as you know, Ted, I really like microwave popcorn, so I think of this every time I make microwave popcorn. The premise of the ad is that it's movie night on the Enterprise and they need the proper VHS tape back to Gabriel's yawning VHS machine. And, uh, you know, Shatner is, you know, Captain Kirk is in the blockbuster, like trying to get the proper tape, right? And, you know, the question is, are they going to have it or not, you know? And Shatner goes, my crew has already made popcorn. I, I, I had to have heard this 20 years ago, and I still can't make popcorn without saying out loud in the kitchen, my crew. <laughs> That's already my popcorn. You know, there's also a version of Leonard Nimoy sing singing If I Had a Hammer. Also fantastic. I'm going to get some links from you, Ted. Uh, I'll tell you this. I actually made a Pandora station for Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> it's worthwhile. Oh, yeah. I, I need that link too. <laughs> you got some kooky. All right. Thank, thank you. Man. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, I Next, believe. Uh, Robert and then Kate. That's right. And then Mark. The McCord. The McCord is coming up. Yes. All right. All right I'm going to mute. See you, Can McCord. You oh, oh. Can people hear me? Yeah, I hear you, oh. baby. All right. Robert, you're good. Okay. You might want to turn off your card again a little bit. He's kind of loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let me make sure I can get this. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to read from, uh, it's a novel I started. Um, I'm about five chapters into it. Um, and I'm finally in the year 2020. So... The last thing I read from you guys was taking place in like 26, 1926. Uh, and before that, I wrote a novel that took place in the 1880s. So I kind of feel like I'm finally arriving to today. Uh, and I kind of like it because I don't have to do all that research. I just write. And um, so this novel's had a couple different names. Right now I'm calling it Fox Glen. So um, it's, uh, it's about a guy who lives in northern Illinois and teaches English at a community college. 
uh, purely coincidentally, right? Um, but it's really, it's not, it's not really much about teaching. It's really about where he lives in Fox Glen. And um, I don't know, it's, this is, I'm gonna read from the, just, I'm just gonna read from the beginning. Like I said, I've got five chapters going in. Um, and uh, well, we'll just see what happens. So uh, this is called chapter one, license plates. Stoplights are the worst. They stop you from going where you're going, just so someone else can go where they're going. Dan gripped the steering wheel and kept his foot on the brake. The only alternative was the dreaded roundabout. He wasn't going to let that happen to, the, to his city. As if he had any say in the matter, which he didn't. Some faceless, unknown committee of townies, the ones who own the real estate and the major businesses, they are the ones who decide. It's all based on money. Dan knew with, with no real evidence. It's all about contracts and the corruption. January in Fox Glen is brutal. Northern Illinois at its worst. Today it was both snowing and raining somehow. The roads were wet and slippery and somewhat icy. He knew how to shovel the driveway and sidewalk. He knew he had to shovel the driveway and the sidewalk later in the day. And he knew that it would be back-breaking back shovelfuls of slushy, ice-wet snow and half water. The car's license plate in front of him as he waited for that red light. Butter, B-U-T-T-E-R. That's it. That's what the driver wanted to tell the world. Butter. Dan shuddered at the thought of the creature behind the wheel of the Cadillac SUV in front of him. What sort of monster had this license plate? A butter baron? A dairy farmer? Someone from Wisconsin? It being, of course, in all caps, was a bleeding shout to the world. Look at me, pay attention to me. I'm clever. My car says something. The back of, of the car had the inevitable magnetic ribbon too. Support something or other, the font was too small and cursive to make out in this weather. Dirty snow and ice caked the car as it did all cars. Cold, wet snow fell to the ground like World War I biplanes shot out of the sky and spinning lazily to the ground. Dan tightened the grip on the wheel. Yes, he was driving a Subaru Forester, he thought with gritted teeth. His wife, Rachel, chose it. She said it would carry her paintings and art supplies. Dan wanted a white Volvo station wagon, his dream car, but maybe they didn't make them anymore anyway. That was his white whale, the Volvo. He knew he would never own one. That in and of itself was something though, he thought. Absence or loss was a thing too, something to possess or own. Does that make sense? Driving an SUV was against his principles because he didn't care, but he didn't care enough to win that fight with Rachel. Besides, it was a nice car, he had to admit. He noticed another plate, a car a few, a car, a few cars up in the right turn lane, Hapuna, H-A-P-U-N-A. It was a beach in Hawaii. He looked it up once after seeing it several times, one of those neighborhood cars. That's the thing, you see the same cars around town, but mostly you don't know it since they're just common cars and random license plates. But these vanity plates that are so popular in Illinois, they make you realize that you're driving with the same bunch of suburbanites every day. It's depressing. And when he, when he saw a new plate, he had to figure out what it meant. That couldn't be ignored. H-U-U-R-U. D-O-G-L-V-R. W-I-N-E-G-A-L. Dog liver? Mr. Weingal? Miss Huru? Dan did have the slightest desire for his own plate, but he kept the idea private. It was as ridiculous as all the others. Now, Dan, being from Ohio, grew up without the vanity plate thing, since Ohio frowned upon it 
or most, most other forms of communication. It may not look, at, look like it to outsiders, but there is a spectrum of difference when moving from Ohio through Indiana to Illinois. Three stations in purgatory, perhaps, but each had its own place. Of Indiana, he could not speak, for other than driving through it on the turnpike and going to one conference in Indi Indianapolis years ago, he knew nothing of the state. Many, many, many years ago, as a child, he went to a summer camp, Camp High Hope. It was in Illinois, or Indiana, but he doesn't know where. Maybe he doesn't want to find it. Indiana seemed to be filler between Ohio and Illinois, according to Danny. They made RVs there, he knew, and there were the Amish. The green arrow turned, the green turn arrow lit up and everyone could make their left. Dan was heading for work, Blake College. He taught in the English department and he had done so for 15 years. He expected some reward for this. At five years, he got a pin. And at 10, he got a certificate for a jewelry store where he bought a watch. So for 15, now what? He had no guesses, nothing probably. Those days are over. The radio was playing the local jazz station coming from another community college, one with a much bigger budget. When his wife and kids were in the car, however, they listened to classic rock, courtesy of a Chicago station. But when alone, he liked jazz or classical, both public radio stations, of course. He thought a lot about music as it had an important role in his psyche. Classic rock for family driving, jazz for in the car alone. More classic rock for working out in the basement on his beloved elliptical. Classical for pacing around the house. This was when he listened to vinyl records. Beethoven, that's all there need to be said. Beethoven. Work was 15 or 20 minutes away, a short commute. Rachel had made sure his route did not include any railroad crossings. She was very thoughtful and detail oriented in everything. Dan liked this as it gave him more time to think about other things. Most of life was thinking about things, wasn't it? The traffic was light. He didn't know what he was listening to, except that it wasn't anything he would have chosen. They hardly ever played his favorites like Wes Montgomery or Barney Kessel or Monk. Sometimes they did, but he didn't always recognize it. He wasn't a jazz expert. There was too much Latin jazz on this station. Too much beat. He wanted bebop. Benson Road stake north, swerving this way and that, past houses and an assigned living place and some houses for humanity homes. He drove past the high school where his daughter, Nova, attended as a sophomore. Nice school. They chose their neighborhood for the schools, of course. Don't all would-be parents do this? They even decided to move after Nova's middle school so she could attend this nearby one and not the one she would have gone to at the old house. His son, Luther, was in middle school. Dan also passed a Lutheran church, a Catholic church, which tempted him being brought up Catholic, but so far nothing, and more houses. Even his old house was half a block down a side street he passed. Then at Route 22, he made a left. 15 years working at Blake College with this route being the latest for the last two years. Getting to work was the first part of, of being at work. Dan taught freshman composition, world mythology, Bible as literature. Those were his worlds and he enjoyed them immensely. Spring semester was the Bible class and he chose to focus the readings on the seven deadly sins. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, Sloth, aren't they the best parts of the Bible? His students wrote papers on them, which with of course lust being the most popular. Uh, Dan was most interested in gluttony, however. He was fine with pride and, and thought highly of himself. He didn't mark himself as very greedy, otherwise he wouldn't be a college teacher. Envy didn't seem like much of a sin, just human nature. Who doesn't like lust? Sloth, big deal. Gluttony was something he understood and something that, that could be worked on. Thus, the elliptical in the basement. Oh, and wrath. 
too much of that in the world, but, but he didn't feel it in himself. Anyhow, the students found it more interesting than the history of ancient Israel or the prophets. Even the Gospels didn't seem to excite them too much. He always expected the self-professed Christian students to have more to say in class, but they didn't. Route 22 moved north to the college. He made the turn in the midst of the old downtown of Fox Glen, which was just a short block of old brick buildings. The other old downtown up north a bit was the old downtown of Merlin. The two neighboring towns merged in the 19 aughts and became today's Fox Glen. Why bother having two towns so close together? That must have been the thought. The old Fox Glen strip of uh, brick blocks had several restaurants, none of which lasted more than six months. There was a diner that had been there for decades, or at least decades that he had heard of since he hadn't been here for decades. Uh, then the old Bell Telephone building, like all towns had, Another block and then the murder house on the right, boarded up since the late 90s when a man murdered his family and himself. It was a peeling white bungalow from the 20s, surrounded by overgrown trees with empty lots on either side. Wooden shutters on the front windows and dark curtains on all the others kept the mystery inside. Dad didn't move here until 2005, so he didn't know the local lore and legend of the place. One of his students told him about it. The story was like all the others, incomplete and sad. The man just murdered everyone and then killed himself. Nothing came of it. No one knew. Every town had its murders, suicides, and other sad crimes. He passed by the house as he did every other day. Beyond that was an animal hospital, a podiatrist, and an insurance agency. Life goes on. He always compared this place to his hometown in Ohio, Rangeline. Couldn't help himself. Um, Illinoisans drove faster. They gunned their cars through amber lights and those damned license plates. Not that he wanted to return to tiny town as he called it now. There was nothing there for him. School friends had mostly moved out as had his siblings. His parents had passed away years ago. His junior high was gone, bulldozed, and turned into a park. The streets were impossibly small. A classic small town beginning. This place, Fox Glen, was a real suburb of Chicago, an exurb, perhaps, almost at the end of the train line. It was the Neptune to the sun of Chicago, or maybe Pluto, but it was still there. Rangeline? That was a distant asteroid orbiting Toledo, a dying star. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, it's 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Great, Robert. I like the Toledo metaphor, having grown up close and spent time in Toledo, it is a dying star. Yes. <laughs> it is. My brother lived there, I knew it my whole childhood. It was always a dying town somewhere. It was, yeah. But it's still there. Mud hens, the best thing about it, the mud, mud hens. hens. Exactly. Well, we also still say Holy Toledo if we're really old. So yeah, like, Toledo. it's moved on. <laughs> yeah. And I'll put a plug in for the Toledo Museum of Art is yes. incredibly excellent. It Van is. Gogh's incredible things you would not expect from kind of a Rust Belt city. It's got really? a museum. They, ah. And they get good shows. I saw a, um, a Greco show there. They get really good shows of yeah. all things. I don't know why. Toledo Zoo is one of my favorite zoos. It's an awesome little zoo. Yes, Toledo <laughs> Zoo is great too. My brother used to live nearby. You could hear the lions roaring from his house. Yeah. Really? That's yeah, awesome. it's, it's just right there in the middle of the neighborhoods. It's pretty weird actually. Yeah, it's really cool. It's got really cool old buildings too. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to live by a zoo or by a graveyard or by a zoo that is a graveyard. <laughs> a zoo on one side, a graveyard on the other. <laughs> You're right in the middle. Yeah, intriguing, Robert. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this uh, teacher character who teaches Bible as literature. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I've never know. heard of such a thing. <laughs> strange, quirky guy. I'm so <laughs> creative. I just invent things out of thin air. <laughs> I kind of like his syllabus, though. Um, yeah, <laughs> the syllabus. Uh, right. The seven deadly sin thing. That's yeah. Nice. 
Actually, I don't do that, but I should. That sounds like a lot of fun. It does sound very cool, actually. Maybe next spring, you know? Right. I mean, you just got to kind of be thick-skinned with all the lust papers. Yeah, that's going to be the... <laughs> That's going to be their favorite, I'm sure. <laughs> Amber, there she is. <laughs> I was searching you out. Ah, uh, okay. I, you know, we are now complete. It has all come together at last. <laughs> the Amber has arrived. Uh, you know, I didn't understand uh -oh. too, Amber, what was missing inside. But uh, okay. now we're here. Yep. Uh, We'd like to wrap up this evening with Mark. With the usual thing. That's yeah. right, Waters. Uh, uh, I guess I'm going to keep myself right on because I'm doing a little yeah, something. You're on, baby. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just adding a little something. Uh, we, tried, you know, we tried to get Charlie Watts on the couch drum, but he wasn't available. Uh, you saw the uh, big, this big Zoom broadcast. Okay. Can everyone hear me out there? Is that coming through? Is it loud enough? Let me hear. Ask the ask the good people out there. Can the gallery hear me here? Yes. Yeah, I think you're good. It's just small notes. It's not like something big here. It, it just like a little notes. Hey, it's Mike Hillstrom, everybody. He came back. I'll, I'll gladly sit in. I've been here the whole time. Uh, if you'd like me to sit in, I will uh, add in some notes too. Nice. Do it, baby. You got yeah. it. Play it. Ah, okay. Hillstrom. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna pin Ted up here instead of the Kate, like who looks like she's seen a ghost. I think Kate just said, fuck you. I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't find Mark. Why? He's not coming up for me. Oh, he's not? No. Really? Weird. Hold on, I'll find you. He's up for me. What about the rest of you guys? Is Mark there? Is Mark, is Mark there? Mark's there, unless you're speaking. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I got it. Okay. Um, now Kate's there. <laughs> now Kate's like like dominating the screen, totally. <laughs> Was it Ian who mentioned the perfection of imperfection? I think so, with the Star Trek bit. Well, this is like the imperfection of imperfection. So you've got a non-guitar player playing through all kinds of kooky technology. Ted and I were trying to, like, get a level so this would sound normal. Which thing, we probably, I don't know, spent like an hour and 20 minutes just getting the level. So... Yeah, it's weird. I mean, right, Mr. Hillstrom, the Zoom is strange. But, uh, so, now this is, this is for Gabe, who, like, hey, I cannot believe, I mean, Gabe was here when I got here in 2001. We started in the same office, actually, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm in my 20th year. You know, um, just starting it. Um, 20 years. I mean, career go like, it just come and go like nothing. But, um, so I started out, I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's do a little song. I've got this thing. I've got the one I did for Tom, which was Tom is on my side when Tom left, our former D. And then um, we have one, we kind of have a work in progress for Brock when he was leaving called Brocket Man. Tony was a big fan. <laughs> that was great. And then uh, so man, I'm like, oh, you know, what if uh, we did something to Hall and Oates? She's gone. Uh, like, that was hard to do, oh, but yeah, we did. It. But I'm like, you know, it's not really a guitar song and it was tough to, but I come up with a couple, a couple of verses. One of them kind of went like this. I'm just gonna acapella this, so people be with me. Sing along if you know the lyrics. More than a guy on some committee. <laughs> what would that city be without VCO? Heard a rumor he'll be retiring. But who's gonna proofread all our comma splices on Capsi? She's gone. 
So it was kind of like that. I didn't work it out. It rough. But verses were coming out, and then I'm like, I can't do that one. So um, this one's called I Got You, Gabe. Um, you may have heard the tune before. Okay. Um, and that helped me with, it gave me one two idea. It's Billstrom. That was nice. Yeah. Hey. So, uh, I don't even know. We don't really have a star. We've only practiced it uh, once or twice. Sorry, I practice it much more. Oh, it's, it's yeah. Just, just do your thing. I will. My thing is kind of like this. College hieroglyphs, MLA scrolls, tell the ancient birth of the one called Jesus. No one has faculty, no one knows, no elder saves, not even me. We got you, gay. We got you, gay. No one can take your place. When you're retired, where will you go? Oh, wherefore art thou? the sky maybe run off with Billy Shakespeare somewhere online now we say goodbye farewell to the MCC and the owl out at Top again, sorry. There's a little bit of a still need you to grade and correct. Still need you to edit a set. Still need you. I still believe that every textbook might be free. Still need tonight still need you to business and technically right <laughs> still need you we won't let go like Juliet needs her Romeo back with Beth tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow
<laughs> we love you, brother. We'll miss you. Uh, then we're getting a better guitar player. Thank you, Mark. That was nice. Alan wrote a song for me. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Guys, I'm, I'm, I'm taking Will Shakespeare with me. I'm, All right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir, Gabe. Yeah. So, uh, gee whiz. Well, I just, I just don't know how to like, you know, end it. It's so nice seeing everybody again. Fine work. And so glad you decided to do this. Pull it yeah, together. thank you, Anne, for pulling it together yeah. and, you know, making it happen. And for the reminder that scared us all to death and reminded us that we had to write something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, since it's my last uh, typewriter factory in my last two weeks at MCC, um, that, well, I'm, I'm excited about carrying out all my plans once I can. Because it seems like with this pandemic and all the restrictions, right. it's just more hurdles than anything else. But, you know, I'm just um, holding out, taking it easy one day at a time. But um, uh, only when I decided to retire did I realize how much I, I, I would miss it. Um, um, particularly, you know, I was just one day sitting behind uh, my students as they were typing and drafting, and I was just sitting by the printer. And that, that, it just hit you know, how much I was going to miss that. Little did I know that we were going to end the semester, you know, zooming, and um, but uh, still, and uh, how much I love MCC. Uh, that's another thing that uh, you take it for granted until you know you're not going to be there, and then realize how much. I mean, how much I like it, and Ted, and you and I, and Mark have seen MCC or from one college into another into another and get now to the the, the, the speed of the new millennium <laughs> so i will miss you all guys um but with limitations i have to admit <laughs> um, as soon as i can um i am going to be rving for as many years as my body can do it I want to do it. So, but it all depends on when I can pick up my RV. And then um, off I go. And yes, Mark, I will travel to England as often as I can to the globe. That's a fact. Yeah. Hey, man. Uh, we're going to miss you too, Gabe. Yeah, brother. You're right. Just take it for granted. You're going to be there in the hallway. <laughs> I'm kind of just strolling past and like, hey, Gabriel, what's going on? <laughs> you know, and, uh, it's going to be an odd, odd sensation. Uh, well, you know, it's, it is. And you, like you said, Gabriel, um, we've seen the, we've seen the college change. Yeah. And we've, you know, you know, you don't really know until people start leaving, I guess, just how much the college is really um, built around people and uh, you identify really with people, you know, um, and you're one of those, you know, gosh, I mean, we've been in different parts of the building, Ted and I. Um, I remember walking into the, well, it's nowadays our ivory tower. Um, I remember uh, when- It's under construction? Right, there was like yellow tape and says, do not go, and Paulette saying, oh, come on, let's go take a look. <laughs> ah, Paulette. <laughs> Wandering around the bricks and the dust and, and no lights or anything. And we couldn't make head or tails of it because it was like a just const raw construction. And, uh, and here we are. So, yeah, it's, um, everything comes to, to, I mean, full cycle. I'm glad that uh, I was able to hopefully contribute to the college, to the students, yeah. 
And like I said, I'm going to display my big wings as soon as I can and enjoy whatever is left. That's right, man. Yeah. Right on. That's right. The next journey, the next adventure. Mm -hmm. It's going to be exciting. I'll I'm be happy up. for you. Happy yeah. for you. And if you're still around. the last typewriter factory either. Yeah, you can come back. That's right. <coughs> I would love to. I would love to. Because, uh, well, I was thinking, you know, since we are um, stuck in this, wow, I'm really glowing. Um, in this Zoom. Um, Join the club, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Since, uh, we're stuck in this environment for at least the summer um why don't we i don't know we could do something like this again you know we're all kind of just i know okay i know that you should just say i i feel like call I call me the day before i do this to myself all the time. The hour I'm like, before. why right. did i get right. myself into this and then i'm like let's do it again <laughs> right. i agree uh, maybe summer maybe the yeah. end of summer yeah yeah yeah. I'd totally be up for it. Let's do it. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Anne? <laughs> we put it on Anne. Hey, Anne, could you arrange that for us? And yeah. Oh, Anne. Well, I thought that was just understood. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, like, uh, <laughs> I get all the credit, though. Don't forget. Please. <laughs> I, and I still want to make a point here. Listen, you. <laughs> for everything that my cat only when Ted was reading, came up and sat here and stared at the screen. That cat is sleeping way over here in the corner of the bed, only for Ted's reading. Oh, dear. that's yes. creepy, Ted. That's, uh, creepy. that's right. Are you listening, Kate? Huh? <laughs> I think she said cat. Cat, not Kate. <laughs> uh, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> great and i miss everybody um yeah, so here, tired here. of not being in the building and not seeing everybody's face i, I know really i know nice. what do you guys what do you guys do you think so what do you think are we going to be back in some way in the fall i mean i i, I think so but i think it could be different. you know we got to be ready i i don't know i don't know. i don't know I know they've got ideas. Uh, oh, hey, and you know, Kate, did you see that about those enrollments that Chris Gray sent out? And I think, I think one thing that's interesting to consider, part of the reason I think all this Zoom stuff worked so well, um, as well as it did, I should say, is because we already had our students till midterms. Like I knew them and they knew me and like right. we could get through that together. I can't imagine starting this way like starting the fall i would almost beg like can we please just have two weeks before you send us away just so that they can know me and we can get through like that hard initial stuff together i just i can't imagine how hard it would be doing like you know a, a learning community and a lit class never having <coughs> had my hands on them you know i know that sounds silly because it's not like i can't see them like this but you guys know what i mean it's just so different and i know we're okay because we already had been good at what we were doing for, you know, seven, seven weeks, eight weeks. So yeah, eight weeks. <clears throat> so I don't know. I'm just really squirrely about it. I know there's, there's different dynamics we'll have to keep in mind. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, trying I hope... to, oh, I'm trying to not, you know, the only thing that's saving me because when I start thinking about the fall in that environment, I start getting really anxious about it. So I don't know. I'm just trying to focus on the now <laughs> I agree if we if we keep thinking so far ahead and trying to figure it out I mean one day I'll read that they're gonna have like 12 people in classes and then it's like so impossible some of the things I yeah. read <laughs> so I'm like okay I gotta stop reading and just like we'll just focus on now for now and yeah I agree we'll just have to wait and see yeah um, okay. it's when you probably tell your kids to read I'm telling you, I have a daughter you know in the middle of a big college thing and I'm like one day we'll do this today and this tomorrow and see what happens, right? I mean, there's no other way to live right now. Um, How are you doing, Amber? Yeah, I love your purple wall, Amber. <laughs> yeah, look at Amber's groovy space. Yeah. <laughs> Amber, uh, yeah, say something so we can see you. Where is she podcast from? 
<laughs> Wait, let me just say this. Can I want to post this video on our Facebook I'm, uh, I'm crashing. If you I'm guys crashing. Uh, in the chat, give me permission. It's not an I want that on Facebook. <laughs> well, you can edit it out if you don't. But yeah, if you please. don't mind, put, uh, write it down right there. I oh, I don't give a did. shit. Do whatever you want with it as far as I'm concerned. Look <laughs> at the chat, Ted. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I think it'd be good advertising. Power, power. <laughs> I mean, it should be out there, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, it's like, why are we doing this if it's not to throw it out there? Patricia's um, like going to read it and come get Kate. <laughs> oh, you know what? I actually, did you see Kate turn? I think Krisha was at the door. <laughs> I think Kate heard the ominous sound of zippers. <laughs> My dog keeps barging into the room. Uh, didn't you hear what we were saying? <laughs> All right, so Amber, you are wait, up. Wait, wait. Amber, where are you? Can you guys hear me? Sometimes I have problems with this. It's not great, Don. Amber. I heard it. I don't hear. Where yeah, is she? I don't know what to talk to. Is she there? Uh, looks like she hid the video. Amber, if you can hear, she want to try no video but talking. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you are. Wait, I just saw you, Amber. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Mhm. Mm Okay, mine doesn't always come through. I've been struggling with that in class. Uh, yeah, I'm crashing in a friend's house, so I'd like to take uh, credit for the uh, decoration of the room, but they just got some good taste around here. I'm still online for school like you all. Terrible. Uh, but pushing through. Only only in for like another week, and then I'm all done. So, And then mm. in the fall, I'm either online, I've heard, or small class. I guess we'll see how that goes, but there's lots of reading. Yeah. And yeah. good? That's the truth. Oh, there. You're back. How's Krisha? <laughs> <laughs> see, and there's no getting around that name. There's like one person named that on the earth. So that's why I have to like just let's edit that out of there. Well, yeah. Hey, Gabriel. And good luck to you. Yes. I'm Thank you. a great colleague. Thank you. And I'm glad to have worked with you. Thanks, man. Yeah, it really went. Truly, Gabriel. We clocked a lot of years. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if, if, if you make the um, typewriter factory open to people from outside the college, um, then. Emeritus. Yeah. Who, who, somebody threw that out there. Oh, yeah. So I'll, 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 um, so long as I have an um, internet connection, uh, because I will be RVing and all that stuff, but um, I will be happy to participate. And hopefully I will have, my life will have a bit more variety than it did over the last 61 years. So um, I'll be able to contribute something different. Gabriel, oh, I will, Gabriel I think... you'll, you'll never truly be outside the college. Right. <laughs> Never. Yeah. <laughs> You're never always... One never leaves MCC. No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh. You're That's part fun. of the family. Have right. huh. you guys I, been I in the catacombs? I hear, yeah, I hear, <laughs> I hear Alphys is somehow rummaging around the catacombs. Oh, he is. Yeah. Alphys, Walt, you name it. <laughs> Even Tony, you know, the math guy comes down there once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Paul Ed Fret, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Cat. Right, I've got to go. I've got to bail out, guys. Good night, everyone. Bye, Lisa. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again this summer. Yeah, we'll talk okay. Bye. Say adieu as well. Peace. God bless you all. Bye. Bye. Are you out, buddy? Bye, everyone. Bye, Gabe. Bye, Gabe. Thank you. Thanks, Ted, for your accompaniment. I'm holder. What'd you say? I like the candle holders you Oh, thank you. Yeah, my, uh, right, my, my people. Oh, Hillstrom, you're nailing it. Hillstrom. Play us out.
using to teach with. Is that oh, that Fender Rhodes? Uh, I, it, it's got a Rhodes uh, setting on it that I used earlier. Oh, man. Yeah, that is so groovy. That is. Yeah. you still got that Fender Rhodes, though, right? Uh, in the music department, it's sitting there. Nobody uses it, but it's really? there. Yeah, Isn't it kind of a statute of limitations on some of those. Yeah, can I just like, yeah. can I just like go in there and take it? Would that be all right? <laughs> I, I've I've oh. tried that myself, but it's too heavy and big, and bulky. How big is it? Uh, you know, like a full length piano, really, and just yeah, it's it's a beast. Wow, wow, sounds pretty cool though. Yeah, I I dig that sound. I always have. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, that's what people say. You know. uh, Ted, what? Before you guys get jamming, I want to transfer um, hosting of this meeting to you because I need to get online uh, with my Zoom buddy and Peace, everybody. watch more Star Trek. Oh, <laughs> by the way, uh, I love that. Well, Is if you guys, out? if you guys are left already? On, I can transfer ownership over to you. If no, you want I, think, to I think I got to go to. I'm hungry. Okay. Hey, great yeah. job tonight. It Good worked job, out. everybody. Amber, it's so nice to see you and hear you. Amber, super nice to see you. She might not be there. She was logged in twice, and I think logged oh. out, and now there's a miscellaneous login there. Okay. Well, okay. I well I end the meeting if you guys are okay. You yeah. okay? Yeah, let's end it. Yeah. Okay. I'll All see right. you all later. Bye. Okay.